Hi everybody, this is Burke Hammer. <laughs> I'm Bobby Watts. There you go. We're uh, <laughs> hi everybody. This is actually hi everybody. This is yeah. number five, episode number five. Made it this um, far. Can you believe we made it this far? Oh that's my crazy, dude. God, that's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. And uh, thank you for your support. Yeah, we're here at the uh, Toledo Week Signal Show. Week Signals. Yeah, Week yeah, Signals. Week signals. Uh, Week signals. Toledo, Ohio. This is mm-hmm. probably the largest um, trade show for dude, uh, RC stuff in the United States. Huge, a lot huge. of planes, a lot of helicopter stuff. Yeah, man. Submarines. Um, not a lot of cars, but uh, a lot of submarines. Yeah, submarines. All kinds of yeah, stuff. Man. So uh, we're uh, we're just uh, gonna be talking about what, Bobby? We're doing uh, big electrics. This episode is gonna be big electrics. So we're doing uh, maybe are we doing five hundreds or six hundreds? We we're gonna do we're doing six hundreds. Uh, so we're doing apparently well, we're doing. We'll talk a little bit about five hundreds, okay. but we'll we'll focus. Yeah. So we're doing six hundreds and seven hundreds. Big stuff. The little guys are a completely different animal. Yeah. So we're gonna take a whole episode on the little guys because. This guy's the expert with all the 250, 200, We'll do, we'll do the small ones, yeah. yeah We've gotten a lot of requests. We're not ignoring you guys. We're going to do the small ones, too. But yeah. uh, this time around, number five, we're going to talk about large electrics. <sighs> Big stuff. So yep. I'm going to run everyone through the differences between nitro and electric and do some different things. Uh, we got a cool flight by Matt Bodos. Uh, some cool interviews. So it should be pretty fun. We got an interview with Thunder Power guy. Thunder Power, uh, we yeah. got an interview with uh, uh, Castle Creations. Big D. Uh, Big, Big D, D was Big there. D. We've got yeah. some cool stuff. We've got some cool stuff coming uh, up. So um, let's go to our uh, famous intro. Our famous intro? Yeah. All right, we can do that. Okay, we're going to talk about, address a couple of things that, yeah. uh, that uh, came up to our attention here recently. Well, okay. first of all, we have a couple of new series. We have Smack 101. 101. Bobby's taking care of that one. Heck Tell yeah. them real quick we're what that's about. starting from the beginning. Everything from the beginning. We're going to take you from knowing nothing up until like hovering, forward flight, forward flips and stuff. And then this guy takes over in learning I'm 3D. Doing learning 3D. I'll start with the very basis, basics of 3D. So basically where oh, yeah. Bobby ends, I pick up and... Mm-hmm. And then we go from there to like the most advanced maneuvers. So it's going to yeah, take man. a long time to get all this done. Yeah. But uh, the cool thing about it is if you guys watch the and you keep thing. up with us and you do the practice, you practice what we, re- we suggest you practice, um, then you can, you can actually, it. yeah, you can do it. You so by the time it. we're done with this, you, you should be at that level. It'll be cool. If you work hard at it. So it'll be cool. cool. Dude, we have haters too. We have haters. Yeah. Unfortunately. On online. You went online. commercial too fast. No, you went commercial too fast. Yeah, obviously we're doing something right. So if people hate us, um, we appreciate. All power to you. Yeah, we appreciate uh, your support, guys. If you're obviously watching this, you bought our episode. We support. We're thankful for that. That's cool. Um, That's for those of you who doubt our, I don't know, our knowledge or our ability to do this, um, keep in mind that we are heavily involved. Yeah. In helicopters, we usually get the stuff. Uh, and we test, test it. a lot of stuff. Um, we test we've been a lot involved of stuff. in a little bit of design as well, so yeah. I believe we have enough knowledge to. I think so. To talk with authority, so I we're actually so. just doing this to help you guys. Yeah. Um, so if we come in and weigh our two cents, that's probably because we help create it or help tweak it or yeah. something along Either we those designed lines. it, <laughs> we are indeed it. Yeah. We made changes to it before it was, you know, it went into production, yeah. something. But we're, you, you pretty much, if if that's we us. give you a suggestion, we really know what we're talking about. We yeah, will not listen. guess anything, that's yeah, for let's, sure. Let's see what else. Um, so we're getting less tech emails. Uh, we personally answer every email if you guys can't download things, if your uh, trials expire or something. So people are learning the system, which is cool. Less work for us, so thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. What else? Anything good? No, I think that's it for How's now. How's life, man? You doing life good? Life is good, yeah. You busy? You. Yeah, busy, busy, busy. busy, busy. busy that's something else people don't realize how much time it takes to do this. Oh, it's stupid. So, and we've already talked about this on our website, mm-hmm. on the forums, everywhere else. It's, uh, 
we're really doing this to help you. We're yeah. really not getting rich from doing this. Um, this was $11 we, yeah. at Walmart. You know, we have to travel sometimes places, spend money. We have to spend yeah. several days shooting, Heck yeah. several days editing. Heck yeah. We got oh, to upload the stuff to the server. It just take, it's a lot of work. So We don't have a medium. There's, for example, people talk about Bob Finless White. He's yeah. a great guy. He knows oh, a lot yeah. about what he's doing. Heck yeah. Go watch his videos because it's really well worth it. He's got he has a medium, him. which is helifreak.com. Yep. And he uses it to send his videos, you know, yep. give his videos out. We don't have that. So we, we had to build our own website, get our own servers, do everything. So we got to pay um, workers. Yeah. Yeah. We got to pay workers. Cameraman. Cameraman. <laughs> this camera guy is awesome. So, all right. So first thing we're going to do is Bobby's going to start off by showing you the differences, the, the main differences main between differences. electric, uh, large electric, electric helicopter and yep. a nitro helicopter. So. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go we'll start there. talking. Yeah, we'll go from there. We're going to give you a lot of tips. We're going to talk about battery technology we're going to talk yep. about in, uh, motors we're going to talk speed about controllers how to, yeah, speed controllers. how to mount stuff how not to blow yourself up yeah we're saying so how to solder. soldering tips heck yeah we're going to talk about kvs uh how to do your math to calculate the kv uh, to get the right motor that you need right battery so heck yeah all right let's move on episode five mm -hmm. okay so here we are with uh, uh this is the fury 55 just basic nitro helicopter this is pretty much your basic layout here uh, so obviously motor pipe your starter shaft all the you know receiver battery kind of everything's focused around here um, a thing with the nitro models is that if you look here's your uh, center line for your cgs everything's below here so your nitro stuff your cgs actually end up here a little bit more unless somebody flips the motor upside down so that really doesn't happen uh, your fuel tank too and so as your fuel tank runs out your cg is going to change this way so basic layout with this here all right, and here's our, uh, this is, I think it's still prototype. This is the 600 version. So same head and tail. Um, so you can see just in a basic different layout, motor's up here, your batteries are up here. So when you look here for your CG, that's why electrics, a lot of time they roll faster. Uh, a lot of times they'll tick tock better, a little bit more nimble. Seems like we can get everything higher up. Um, another thing you want to look at when considering your electrics is like a battery placement. Like, you know, the logos, the, lo the battery slides right in, which is nice. This one, it's like a quick release system. It pops off the front, something like that. So that's something nice, too. Um, and then in these, if you look under here, speed controllers under here. So just your basic layout is very, very different from the Nitro, but it's cool to see it, you know, with the same head and tail. Okay, so here I'm going to show you the fundamental differences between nitro and electric. I chose the 700s because they're identical. Uh, they're the same head, same tail, only difference is the blades. They're exactly the same gear ratio, so it's going to be a nitro versus electric. Same everything, we're going to see the differences. Alright, here we got the electric first. So this is 12S, it should be around 2400 RPM on the takeoff. Now here's my normal mode. All right, now biggest thing with electric is you got a crap ton of head speed in the beginning and power and it drops off. So here we go here. So as you can see, the power is still really good right here. It's a very good head speed. Even from the initial one, the head speed's dropped off a little bit. Really big. Another thing with electrics, they're very, very smooth. You can just see the smooth power of this thing. No shakes, no vibrations, no motor tuning. The initial power is ridiculous. Don't even care. I think we're putting out close to six or seven horsepower here. We'll come down to do tail down take off. Okay, so here we're about three minutes into the flight. I usually get about four minutes out of the sink. Listen how much the head speed's died off. And watch what before. This is full performance towards the end of my flight. I know it's just an arbitrary TikTok or a rainbow, but we can compare that versus the night track. And as you can see, it's immensely dropped down in only a few minutes, whereas my nitro will go for about eight minutes. But the initial power is ridiculous. Another thing with the electrics is the feel in the air. This one weighs a lot more. This thing almost weighs close to 12 pounds when fully ready to go. 
but the power with all the power it just feels like it's light okay now here's the thing with nitro nitro as you know you got to wait for your motors to warm up it's pretty hot out today it's around you know it's around 65 70 75 out i don't know gotta let it warm up so let it warm up all right it's good so now we'll look at the power right off the beginning This looks almost similar to the electric when it was dead. And I'm not even warmed up yet. Another thing with nitro is we gotta tune it. I just flew this yesterday, so it's pretty close to what it needs to be. But as you can see, I'm slightly rich. You can hear the motor, I'm a little bit rich. So right now, normally I would land the tune it. But just, uh oh, that was a big bug. Okay, now I'm warmed up with my nitro. This power that you see here, I will have for eight minutes. <laughs> Nothing will slow down. If anything, it'll get better because you're gonna get lighter with your fuel. You hold about a, you hold about a pound of fuel while you fly. So towards the end, you're gonna have a little bit better performance, actually. All right, as you can see here, I'm about five minutes into my flight and I have exactly the same power as about 30 seconds into my flight. My electric would be down, I would be relaxing and charging, but my nitro, I'm still flying. Now this isn't a bad thing, you just have to gear your electrics differently so you don't get the same amount of performance. But as it looks right now, I don't think there's any electric that can get this amount of performance. 90 size for eight minutes. Motor runs consistently and strong. Although my power to weight isn't as good. Now we'll do an auto. Obviously with a nitro, you know you're doing an auto. Let me see the smoke go away. Mm -hmm. Wait for it, wait for it. So that was our nitro flight. Hi guys, let's talk a little bit about batteries. Um, first of all, it is very important to understand a few key things about batteries. Lithium polymer batteries come in many different flavors. Um, there are practically different brands that range from the inexpensive to the medium quality to the top of the line, very well known brands. You need to keep in mind that expensive is not always good. However, cheap isn't necessarily good either. So ask your friends and do a little bit of research online or at the field before you commit to buying a certain battery. Um, since we're dealing with large electrics, uh, electric helicopters here, you need to be more selective when purchasing your packs. Um, large electrics use batteries that are generally expensive and it is important to be careful when making your purchase. Let's talk a little bit about definitions and what all these names mean. Um, let's start out with voltage. What is voltage? Well, the definition shown by a very well-known encyclopedia says that the voltage between two ends of a path is the total energy required to move a small electric charge along that path divided by the magnitude of the charge. That sounds pretty complex, doesn't it? How about amperage? Um, definition of amperage, also called current, is the amount of electrical energy flowing through a circuit at any given time. And then finally, IR. IR, which stands for internal resistance, um, it pretty much says that it's a concept that helps model the electrical consequences of the complex chemical reactions inside a battery. Wow, these are, uh, these are pretty crazy terms. Let's, uh, let's, use, uh, let's, let's talk about this in layman's terms. Let's use the analogy of a sports car. Let's say that we have a sports car running in a track. Well, voltage, uh, the voltage of a battery, I guess, would be the equivalent to the size of the motor in the sports car. The amperage or the current would be the equivalent to the horsepower of the motor. And uh, the capacity, battery capacity, would kind of be the equivalent to the size of the fuel tank or the gas tank in the car. And finally, the inter internal resistance would be the equivalent to the friction of the tires on the track, I guess you could say. So when choosing a battery, you need to look at uh, three important features. Voltage, capacity, and C rating. Um, the maximum amperage 
or current that a LiPo can deliver. It's measured by multiplying the capacity of the battery times the C rating, and then you divide that number by 1,000. So for example, um, with this Thunder Power 2700 milliamp pack, the capacity is 2700. So you multiply 2700 times 45, which is the C rating, and then divide it by 1000. This equals to a total of 121.5 amps. This is the maximum current that this battery can deliver under optimum conditions. Of course, there is no such thing as optimum conditions, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, basically, um, when it comes to um, LiPo voltage, um, a single cell LiPo stores nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. Nominal means that this is the ideal voltage for the cell during operation. Um, this is sort of an ambiguous term to use for a LiPo because LiPos are capable of storing a maximum of 4.2 uh, volts per cell. So a 6S uh, pack has a nominal voltage of 22.2 volts and uh, and a maximum voltage of 25.2 volts when it's fully charged. Um, so how about wattage? What does wattage mean? Um, wattage uh, is simply the total energy that a battery can deliver. Um, the total wattage is figured out by multiplying the voltage times the amps or the current. So for this same example, this, this 6S battery pack could potentially deliver 3061.8 watts in a perfect world. Um, you figure this out by multiplying 25.2 volts, which is the fully charged voltage of the pack, times 121.5 amps. And uh, of course, this is when the internal resistance comes into play. Like I said before, there's no such thing as a perfect world. Um, when you start pushing current, um, the, higher, the, the higher the current, um, the higher the internal resistance, meaning that your voltage is going to drop. Um, when a battery starts pushing very high amounts of currents, uh, it, it'll observe a voltage drop. And this voltage drop will vary from battery to battery depending on how the internal resistance is for that particular type of cell. Some brands are better than others when it comes to internal resistance. You, you really want to make sure you select the battery with the lowest internal resistance possible. This will not only allow your pack to remain cooler during flight, but it'll also allow it to last longer. Um, so again, wattage is the... Um, uh, sum, or I guess the multiplication correction, of volts times amps. And wattage just simply means power. The more the watts you have, the more, the more watts you have, the more power you're going to have. So, um, for example, let's say that we have a 6S pack um, pushing 200 amps or so. Well, that pack will produce as much power as a 12S pack pushing half the amps, for example. So in other words, the higher the voltage, the less the current or the amps that that battery has to push in order to achieve the same amount of power. And what's important to know here is, is that current or amps generate heat, whereas voltage does not. So you always want to keep your voltage high for maximum efficiency. Um, I remember back in the day, three, four years ago, when T-Rex, when Align uh, released the T-Rex 600 electric. And there was a little bit of controversy because some people argued that, you know, a 50 size electric helicopter was really not a good idea to power it, power it by a 6S pack. Well, Align wanted to make a helicopter that would be affordable for everyone. And back in the day, even up to today, 6S packs were obviously cheaper than 10X, 10S packs. So Align went that route because it was the, the logical thing to do to um, manufacture a helicopter that was affordable. Of course, back in those days, battery technology was not as good. We were dealing with 12 to possibly 18C, um, 12 to 18C battery ratings. Um, nowadays, we're dealing with 45C. Internal resistance was much higher than it is today. So we used to get four or five minute flight and battery was scorching hot and, and, and all this and that. Um, nowadays, you can get a 6S pack that has unbelievable low, low uh, internal resistance, 45C uh, rating, and uh, you can fly a T-Rex 600 with the same 6S setup nowadays for, God, I don't know, four or five minutes of very hard 3D and the battery will barely get warm. So, um, But uh, just so you guys get an idea, uh, 600 size electric helicopters, 50 size electric helicopters, um, operate with uh, cell counts anywhere between 6 and 10S. 
and uh, a 700 size electric or 90 size electric um, ideally operates with cell counts of anywhere between 10 and 12 s so um, uh, again it's important to kind of um, realize that uh, again the higher the voltage the more efficient the setup but uh, it's really not necessary for everyone you got to consider weight um, battery weight you got to consider your ability to charge a very large pack a high cell count pack you got to consider your flying style if you're just hovering or flying around you obviously don't need the most powerful setup so on a 50 size electric like a logo 600 or t-rex 600 a 6s pack would be more than sufficient on a 700 or 90 size model a, a 10s pack would be more than sufficient even probably an 8s pack so these are very important things that you need to keep in mind when selecting your LiPo batteries. All right, here we're gonna give a quick soldering lesson. This is a quick tip, soldering. So here we're gonna be soldering a Dean's plug. So we have our flux, we have our solder, we have the plug, we have the wire, and we have our cutters. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna strip the wire. So when you strip the wire, you want to make sure that you uh, don't cut it. So it's as simple as that. Okay. So now that we've stripped the wire, we're going to pre-tin it with the soldering iron. So we always use a little bit of flux. Get in here, just dip the wire on the flux a little bit. Add some solder. Now what the flux does is it gets the solder all over the wire and doesn't create a cold solder joint. It just really helps the wire heat up and it lets all the solder absorb into the wire. So that looks pretty good right there. So here's our Dean's plug. Actually, we're just going to tape it down to one of the aluminum foil. You can either tape it or use um, a vise or something. You know, you can use some hemostats, but you want to make sure that the heat does not get absorbed. So like a vise may not be the best idea. So we're going to add, a, we're going to tin the Dean's plug as well. So we added some solder to there. We're going to put the heat shrink on first. That is the worst when you get the perfect solder joint and you forget the heat shrink. So the heat shrink first. Add the, uh, the shrinky dinky on there. Excellent. Want to heat up both parts. Get them both molten. Get them both to melt together. Just like that. Let it cool. If you don't do it like this, you may get a cold solder joint. But if you look at this, it's a nice, very well, uh, you can tug on it, you can hang from it, it won't break. Next thing, slide your heat shrink up, put a lighter to it, shrink it down, and kick yourself a goal. All right, we're here at the Toledo uh, Show 2010, and I'm with Jason Merkel. Jason is the VP, it's a huge title, VP of Sales and Business Development for Thunder Power RC. How's it going, man? Very good, very good. It's been a great show for us. How you doing? Good. Doing good. Um, we're uh, trying to explain to people uh, main differences between batteries and battery technology and how important it is to, you know, maintain your batteries and uh, treat them well and, you know, don't, don't store them with a full charge, right. all that kind of stuff. But uh, since you're the expert here, what, uh, what, what do you think uh, people should keep in mind when picking a battery? What's, what's the, you know, for helicopter guys, what, what's, what are the things they need to look into when they, when they make their battery selection? Well, the truth is that the heli is probably harder on the battery than most applications. So basically, you should buy the biggest, highest capacity, highest C rating battery that's going to comfortably fit your model. Airplanes are a little bit different. You get to fly around on the wing, so you can carry a lighter 20C battery and fly 10 minutes and get away with it. Very few helicopters get more than five or six minutes duration. That's a constant 10 or 12C minimum draw. The burst might be in the 25-30C minimum range and our general recommendation is always buy a battery that you're going to use at half of its maximum rating. So when that's said and done, if you're going to average 10 to 12C, you should be buying a 25 to 30C minimum battery for helicopter application. So you can use 20C batteries if you're a sport guy, if you mostly hover, you can get away with that. If you're flying Smackdown 3D, you've got to have at least 30C and better yet 45C or even higher in the future. Gotcha. There's people, there's a misconception. A lot of people think, well, I'm just hovering. I'm just learning to fly. I can buy the cheapest battery, you know, or the, it doesn't matter. C rating doesn't matter, but doesn't really, um, the fact that you have a higher C rating allows battery to run cooler, therefore lasting longer. I mean, there's plenty, there's oh, many yeah. advantages. 
No, that's exactly right. It is almost that easy. The higher the C rating, the cooler the battery's going to run, the easier it's going to be on the battery, the longer it's going to last. So yeah, the 45C battery may cost 30% more than the 20C battery, but you may get 50% or 100% more cycle life out of the battery because now it's working better. And then of course, you may hover now and then you may get the bug to fly 3D and aerobatics later on. And a 20C battery is going to be pushed, it might sag. And the worst thing you can have happen when you're learning to fly 3D is sag. You don't want rotor speed to drop. You want to be able to pop out of a maneuver, bail out of trouble. So you should always go minimum 30C, even from the get go. Now, if you're going to only fly scale, if you're only going to fly upright forward flight, the 20C will work, but again, you're going to get more cycle life out of the 45C or 30C battery. Now, you, you talked about the price difference between a 20C and a 45C or whatever. What about the price difference between these, I don't want to say anything bad, but, you know, I get a lot of people coming to the fields and stuff, and they just buy, like, uh, the cheapest they can get. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to mention brands, but, uh, you know, $20 for, $18 for a three-cell pack for their T-Rex for 50 Why should people go the extra mile and just bought you know spent two three times more to get a battery brand like thunder power for example well very honestly it's not for everybody you know the decision really lies in in your hands of are you going to fly more often than uh once a month if you are then you definitely need to start looking at long-term investment cost per cycle if you're going to fly 100 200 flights in a year you might wear out three or four low-cost batteries and one good quality battery that you can care for properly can last that 200 cycles. You can go buy one battery and actually be ahead slightly when it's all said and done. Now guys talk about, well, what if I crash and I'm going to crash and, and I will crash? Guys might offer a 50% replacement program like we do, which doesn't necessarily make it exactly the same cost, but gets it even closer. And so we highly recommend buying a battery that's going to fit your needs. And if you're only a once a month flyer or once every couple weekends, low cost may work well. But again, if you're going to fly, especially weekend after weekend, especially 3D, and you want consistent power flight after flight, then investing in the higher cost battery is actually going to give you a lower cost per cycle in the long run than it does right up front. Plus, you're obviously, you're obviously dealing with a company that you know, has the right reputation that will stand by the product and will support you guys offer warranty and everything else. Oh, right? In our case, we do. Definitely look around, though. There's guys that sell at a higher price but don't back it up with that service level. So high price doesn't equate to best service, best product. Make sure you buy from a reputable person. We really want everybody to buy LiPo's from any brand as long as they're happy and with the service and support that they get and the product meets their needs. But look at the warranty. Read the fine print. Some people say one-year warranty and then in small print, minimum 50% replacement cost or something like that. We have a full two-year warranty warranty now on our products. So two years if it's defective, if it loses power prematurely, if it gets soft, if it puffs and you didn't do anything wrong, we replace it under warranty 100%, no cost to you. Uh, if you do crash it, 50% replacement. 6S5000, that's a big savings. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a set of rotor blades or a frame, something like that. That's really cool. That's, that's really awesome. And to wrap things up, what is this about internal resistance? Like a lot of people don't understand that very well. Like a, a high um, C rating battery like your top of the line batteries that are 45 C's now right. how does that compare internal resistance wise and you know what very briefly what does internal resistance mean and how does it compare to like a, a lower quality cell that it's say 25 or 30 C well the resistance is what keeps the battery from performing as good as possible so the higher the resistance the less power output that's going to be the hotter that that battery is going to get because the harder it is for the electrons to flow the 45 C battery that we have today the internal resistance is unbelievably almost unimaginably low guys are flying them hammer slamming on them for four minutes they're landing and they're like oh my god it's not even warm last year's 25 C battery would get so hot it puff up shrink wrap would burst off of it basically the resistance of those cells was five times higher now a 5,000 milliamp cell has less than one milliohm of resistance versus years ago uh, with 20C and 25C, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 15. So it's a huge difference. That's why we're able to charge now faster. You're able to discharge faster. They're able to run cooler. So generally speaking, they last longer, period. You get more power and they last longer. And that's across the board. Even our new 20C battery actually has lower resistance than two year ago, 25C batteries. They have more power at less weight that last four times longer. But now the 45Cs, for example, with the extremely low resistance, they're lasting six times longer. We were getting 50 flights before, now guys are getting 300. It's a huge difference. It's a much, much better investment now. And if you have a charger that reads IR, it's even better because now you can track the IR of the battery as it goes, and that resistance will change over time. However, with the newest generation, it stays almost consistent for a few hundred cycles. 
So uh, resistance is going to become more and more critical as time goes on, and our new chargers will have the ability to show you that. So you can say, huh, why is this battery soft and this battery hits hard? Oh, the IR, this one's five times higher, that's why. Great. All right, well, I appreciate the, uh, your time, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about motors. Uh, motors come in a lot of different brands, a lot of different types, of course. Um, but the main different, the, the two ma main different types of motors are the outrunners, like you see here, and the end runners. Um, there aren't really many things that I can actually say about the two. Um, there's a lot of speculation about um, the features of the two and the differences, but they're both good motors. Um, some people say that the outrunner has more torque. Some people say that the end runner is more consistent throughout the flight power wise and that the outrunner tends to lose its power prematurely throughout the flight. I really don't believe any of those theories. I think this is, this changes this is a very subjective um, thing here. It changes from brand to brand, motor to motor, motor um, KV to KV, size to size. So it really doesn't matter. Um, the important thing is to pick a motor that is suitable for your application. Um, that has the right specs, of course. Um, when it comes to speed controllers, same deal here. All speed controller brands are, are really good. I mean, you have Contronic, you have Castle Creations, um, you have uh, Scorpion, you have Align. Um, just, just pick a speed controller that has enough rating to handle your needs. Um, for example, if you think you'll reach peaks of 80 amps, for example, then get a speed controller that can handle at least that, or if not more. Um, a lot of people buy speed controllers that are not rated for their application and they end up pushing more amps than the speed controller can handle and then the speed controller will, will go into what we call a thermal shutdown and it'll shut down and uh, possibly even burn so um, all those brands are good brands even the Align speed controllers I've flown the stock Align speed controllers for years never had any problems so um, so just just uh, just pick a speed controller that you like uh, some of them have more feature than others um, important thing to keep in mind is governor mode. Um, on large electrics, a lot of people like to run governor mode. And uh, there's only two brands of speed controllers that I know of that are capable of running governor mode um, with good success. One of them is the Contronic brand of, of speed controllers. And the other one is the Castle Creations. Um, unfortunately, any other type of speed controller the governor mode will work, but uh, it will not work well. It'll either have a lag, or, the, or, or it'll create more noise than it needs to, which will translate into a tail glitch or something. It just, I just never had much luck with governor mode on any brand other than those two brands I just mentioned. So um, if you plan on running governor mode, um, what you need to do is you need to overgear your helicopter for more head speed than you actually need. And the reason for that is, is that when you run the governor mode, you're going to govern the head speed down. Um, so for example, when you do the math, you gear the helicopter for 2400 RPM on the head and you govern it down to 2200. And that gives you enough headroom so that as the battery starts to die down, the governor mode is capable of increasing your head speed, maintaining the head speed the same throughout the flight. Same applies to when you're doing maneuvers that load the motor hard. So as your uh, head speed dies down with the load of the motor, say TikToks, the governor has the ability to increase the, uh, the head speed and maintain it for you. Um, if you don't use governor mode, then you need to gear your helicopter for optimum uh, for head speed based on 100% throttle. And the way you set up your throttle curve is you just basically set up a straight 100% flat throttle curve. All right, so we're here at the 2010 Week Signals show, Toledo, Ohio. We're here with my very good buddy and second father to me, Mr. Clint Akins. How are you doing today, Bobby? I'm excellent. How are you? Uh, I'm, uh, it's Sunday. It's been a good show. There's been a lot of people come through, and it's, uh, it's Sunday. Got the long drive home. So recently, I'd say recently, so the past, what, four or five years, you've been mostly electric, all electric. Uh, that's right, yep. And is there a reason why you switched over? Because you were a nitro guy before, swore by it. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, I'm a, I was an electrician by trade. Uh, kind of got into electrics. They were real interesting. Um, you can do everything by the numbers with electrics. Kind of makes sense. It's uh, it, it's just really cool. You know, you kind of get into it, uh, and and it kind of goes from there. <laughs>
So have you invested tons of money in batteries and chargers and generators and uh, yeah, I've got a 3,000 watt generator that I run my camper on, and then I got a 2,000 that I run my charging station on. Uh, we usually have that out at Earth to share with folks, and that's uh, yeah, pretty cool. A lot of the local clubs I'm seeing are putting in uh, either solar equipment to charge batteries, uh, self-maintaining kind of kind of deal, 12 volt. Um, but yeah, it's everything's kind of the charge rates have gotten faster on the batteries, so uh, the power systems have come become more demanding for uh, charging so if a guy wanted to start it let's say a guy buys a 600 size or 700 size uh, you know 90 size electric what do you recommend in terms of like a, a power supply or a generator or something that they want to go to the field field and at home um economically uh economically yeah there's a lot of chargers out there um there's there, the new thing has become the uh, dual output chargers where you're getting two chargers for one um you got to be practical you know what are you what are you looking for you know um the the electric guy if you're starting electrics today there's so many good chargers out there so many good brands we're not even going to name a brand here but but there's so much good equipment and the technology's come so far um what you end up with is most everything out there is so good uh just just get a, a good name brand charger to start with uh go from there uh, as far as power supplies, you can get a 25 amp at Radio Shack. That's pretty good. Um, there's the new. Uh, there's a lot of 45 amp power supplies. You know, a lot of companies are selling now. That's what I prefer. You know, you can put multiple chargers on it. But uh, good, uh, you know, switching power supplies is the way to go. And then at the field, a generator or a big lead cell battery or something. Yeah, a lot of guys run off their cars. I, I used to know a guy named Burt Cammer that like killed a killed a Hummer because he was running off his car all the time. Uh, you know, a lot of guys do that in the beginning. Uh, you know, there's guys that fly together all the time. Uh, down near our way, uh, they got together and put power at the field. If that's not an option, uh, they go together and buy a generator together. Uh, you got guys that fly in groups anyway. So, uh, but. But a lot of the fields have have power now um, of some sort. But it's, you know, the generator's the best option. You have it with you all the time. And lastly, I was, I was remembering something you said last night. You were talk, talking about how, uh, yeah, yeah, funny how that works. Uh, a speed controller utilizes power. It does not make power. Actually, it's, the, uh, actually it's the, the system, the power system. On an electric power system, you have power that's there in the battery. You're using that power. With a nitro, you have to develop power. So that's, that's the main difference. A lot of guys like yourself, you get all that power that's available and then all of a sudden you got to, you know, you know, if you keep putting more and more power into the model, uh, you know, all of a sudden you got a you know, three minute flight out of uh, a huge power system. You could drop it back to where you have the same power as, as even, uh, you know, the nitro or maybe a little bit more, 10% more uh, and get a nice decent flight, you know, in time. But it's really cool when you power one up and you go out and kill it for three minutes, four minutes. Uh, it's impressive. Good stuff. Well, thanks, dude. Right. Thank Appreciate you. it, man. So today we're going to talk about your uh, electronic gearing, your head speed, your voltage, your KV of the motor. All this, all these terms I'm sure you've heard be thrown around loosely, but really never quite understood everything. I'm going to try to explain everything to you here. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the battery. Uh, most of the LiPo batteries today that we're running in the helicopters are really awesome. They maintain anywhere from 3.7 volts to 4 volts per one cell for the entire flight. So that means if you have a 2S helicopter, you're going to get a 2S uh, battery, for instance. Most of our receiver batteries, the LiPos that we regulate, uh, get 8 volts fully charged. So we're going to call a 3S 12 volts, 4S 16 volts, 5S 20 volts, 6S 24 volts, a uh, 10S helicopter would be 40 volts, and a 12S helicopter would be 48 volts. So if you take a look here, we'll make a little graph for you. If this is time, and this is voltage, so as our time goes this way, our voltage increases this way. If this is 4 volts and this is 4 minutes, you know, your average uh, flight on your helicopter, for instance, uh, from zero, you would be somewhere around here, then you'd start to drop. So your voltage maintains roughly around 4, and then it drops towards the end. The batteries back in the day, you know, just a few years ago, would stay up here, 
and they'd really start to drop quickly. So as you can see, we've come a really long way in the batteries, which is awesome. These have, had, these have made all the difference in the performance of your helicopter. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is your motor, how to set up your motor. So the first term I have here is kV. And if you don't know, kV equals RPM per volt. So if we wanted to figure out, it's just a little term that they have here. So in the T-Rex 700 that I'm flying here, it's a uh, new 1915 1.5Y. This is just the name of the motor. It really doesn't matter what it is. You just need to look at the kV. That's the most important term here. So if we wanted to flip this equation around here, we would have that your RPM equals the kV of the motor times the voltage that you're running it at. So in my case right here, this is a 450 kV motor. So the RPMs would equal 450 times 48 volts. We have a, uh, we have a uh, 12S in that helicopter. 48 volts. Okay, so we're gonna get out our calculator here. And we're going to figure out how many RPMs, when it's theoretically fully charged up, we're going to see what we run at. I bet you it's pretty high. So 450 kV times 48 volts is 21,600 RPM. This is the RPM of your motor. I hope it's not your head speed, because if it was your head speed, ooh, that'd be scary. So now the next thing that we need to look at is the way the gear ratio and the head speed all work out in this equation here. So we know that the motor, when it's theoretically full, running at full power, is running at 21,600 RPM. So my 700 electric, for instance, has a 164 tooth main gear and a 20 tooth pinion. So we're going to figure out the gear ratio of that. 164 divided by 20 equals 8.2 to 1, which is exactly the same ratio as the nitro, if that makes any difference. So that means that we can take our motor RPM, divide it by our gear ratio, and get the head speed that we have at a fully charged battery. So we're going to do 21,600 divided by 8.2. 21,600 divided by 8.2. Wow, 26, 34, 2,634 RPM. This is at the blades. This is what the blades are running theoretically fully at 100%. That's scary. Now we take in a little bit of you know leeway in here. The helicopter is probably not gonna. The batteries probably aren't gonna be running at 100%. Maybe like. 90%, 80, 85, 90%. So just for fun, we'll multiply it by 81, 85%. So 26, 34 times 85%. 20. So we're running around 2240. So that's our RPM. That's probably going to stay in most of our flights. So we're probably going to stay around 2200, 21, 23 if you're over speeding. Uh, during most of your flight. Now this is in a non-governor mode setup. If you want to run governor mode, you have a whole different story. What you do with governor mode, that the, the governors that are starting to come out on the speed controllers are really good, but they kind of cheat a little bit. So what you do is you put a bigger pinion on. So instead of having a uh, 20 tooth pinion, you put a 21 tooth pinion on. And your head speed would be very, very high. And then what you do in the governor mode is you back it down and you run to around 80 to 85 percent of the normal head speed. So you'd be you'd still get this 2240, but that would be at 80%. That way when it needs to feed in more, it can feed in probably up to 28 2900 RPM theoretically if it has to. And if you're overspeeding, it can back itself down to, you know, a different RPM on your motor to keep your head speed the same. It's pretty much just like a governor mode with a nitro motor. So now that we've gone all over this, you can kind of figure out what you want to do. So for instance, if you're not happy with the way your helicopter is flying, first you can try a pinion change here, or you can try a different KV motor. So this one was 450. Let's say if I wanted a little bit more out of it, I could probably look at like a 480 KV motor. If I wanted to back it down, probably a 420 KV motor. So all this applies to everything. This applies from the little tiny guys to the big guys. So. Now we've done a little bit of mathematics here. 
hopefully you guys understood everything and uh, maybe you can use this when you uh, have to upgrade your motor or speed controller or anything in there. Hey, we're here at the 2010 Birmingham Funfly. I'm here with my buddy Matt Bodos. Matt's been a, uh, I guess I could say a pioneer in the bigger electrics for the past few years. I guess starting off with your logo, right? Yeah, logo in uh, 2006, and uh, I adopted the V-Bar with that logo in 2006. One of the nice. first people to make Pioneers the of the V-Bar yeah, as well, yeah, right? Yep. Yeah. And then now you got your uh, your own creation, yeah, Synergy N9 creation. Electric, correct? Yep, we're calling it the E9. Uh, got some Castle Creation speed controllers on here, and okay. uh, 160, and nice. NEU motor, and 12S running the Thunder Power packs. It's pretty much a monster. Nice. That's yeah. ridiculous. Those are the, like the 45C packs. And yeah, the new 45C Big ridiculous packs, ones. Yeah. Nice. All right, so what's the main difference between electric and nitro for the bigger stuff? The micros are in a league of their own because you really can't compare. Right. But how about like the big stuff? So how would a 90 size nitro compare to a 90 size electric? Well, 90 size electric, you got to deal with some weight issues. So yeah. you kind of got to gear the thing so that you're gonna get at least five minutes, you know, depending on how you wanna fly. You can gear it so that you get, you know, maybe seven, but mm -hmm. you're gonna be stuck at 1900 on the head and, you know, it's not gonna perform as well. So exactly. I tend to lean towards a little bit higher head speed since we're dealing with the So here, it, what are you running here for head I'm speed, for instance? I'm running 2300 on this head. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, Nitro you'd run 1950-ish? Yeah, okay. yeah, 1900, 1950. Okay. And, uh, the, you know, 12 and a half pound helicopter, you're gonna have to spin the, the head a little bit faster to get it to move. Exactly. Now it's heavier, but since it has so much power, do you feel like it's a little bit lighter in the air? Does it feel different in the air? Or? Yeah, oh, it's definitely got more power. It's, yeah. it's got way more power than a nitro. Um, it's slightly different torque curve, so you, you can't sit there and beat it up like you'd beat up a nitro. Right. You gotta kinda be careful how you fly it, but uh, for the most part, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great helicopter. It's a great thing to uh, to invest in. I think it's it's part of the future of helicopters. Definitely agree with you. Now, you can see here, as we'll see in the flight here, there's usually, depending on how hot your setup is or how conservative it is, there's usually a bit of a drop off in the sure. beginning of the flight to the end of the flight. Right. Now, how does that affect your flight? How will you change your flight differently or how does that affect like in a competition, for instance? Sure. Uh, well, I tend to gear the thing so I can get four and a half to five minutes and try to make the taper off as little as possible. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, in the beginning, obviously you want to take yeah, advantage of the aggressive yeah, nature of the yeah, helicopter and, right. and just really get out there and hammer on it. Uh, in the end, maybe you open it up a little bit more, let it breathe. And, uh, but uh, it, it is kind of difficult to compete with because you are dealing with a, a drop off in power. Exactly. Uh, so when you, when you do that, you compete. You try to keep the excitement level up. So exactly. you're flying a nitro, yeah. you can kind of start in slow yeah. and then yeah. you know build it up. You almost want to to let your motor warm up. Right. You exactly. almost have to. And you got a full yeah. tank of fuel, so at the exactly. end of the at the end of the tank, you're yeah. light, you're aggressive. So exactly. It's it's a different beast. Uh, okay. It can be done. People have done it in the past and exactly. made it look really good, but exactly. the gearing and the batteries and all that is really critical on how you choose to set up your model. Agreed. Um, now with the batteries, do you notice a bigger? Do you notice any difference in between like the uh, 450 class helicopters? You know, anything you do differently with these or setups or anything like that? Well, in general, I think you go higher voltage, your your batteries tend to stay cooler, you're less likely to puff them. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a Rave that's a 4S okay. and it, it runs like a champ. Uh, when I had it on 3S, batteries got a little bit hotter, yeah. less performance. I hear you. Um, but yeah, I think uh, if this was on 10S, the batteries would probably be, you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees hotter. They'd be getting hot. They'd be getting pretty hot. So the cool. more voltage, the better, but it's, it's kind of a balancing act. You know, you, I hear you. So, okay, cool. Well, thanks for the interview, dude. Appreciate no it. Now we're going to watch you fly the uh, E9, correct? Great, let's do it. Awesome. All right, so Matt's going to fly his E9 or as I called earlier, the N9 electric, which makes no sense. <laughs> and uh, I'm very scared for this takeoff. I'm standing behind you for this one, dude. <laughs> All right, watch out. You got a little 500 on your left. No, right here, right here. So Matt's going to demonstrate the power of an electric helicopter. 50 volts, 12 pounds. Probably about seven horsepower. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Wow. Just so y'all know, the ground just shook. Dude, that thing moves. Jeez. Matt's here doing the ditch with the uh, E9, which is ballistic. 
So you can hear all the pop that it's got. But if you slowly start to listen out, he's about 30 seconds in, a minute in, it's slowly starting to taper off, which is one of the disadvantages of these big electrics. Well, you can hear it grunt just when it digs in. Nice. Look at that. That's stupid. How many horsepower is this, do you know? Uh, we're probably, probably about eight. Eight horsepower. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Nice. Got the crowd cheering in now. Nice, dude. Oh, shit. <laughs> There's some old school photos right here, man. This is badass. Nice. I think it's just a monster. <laughs> As I slowly step back a little bit. Oh my god. Oh, there you go. All right, watch out, you got a guy chaosing right there. You know, that made me reminisce of a video you had here a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that midair was nasty. A Fury was cheaper to fix than the Raptor after he hit it. I think it's a sick power. Now, after the initial head speed drop, it's still hanging in there. Right now, it's still about after it was, you know, a minute into the flight. Nice, dude. Just gonna crisp the blades off. Oh. It's about done. You can could, you could feel the power start to drop. It's about done. Yeah, the power drops off a little bit. How's it auto for being so heavy? It's good. Auto as well? Yeah, nice. Nice. Yeah, these electrics are just nuts with all that power. Nice. Sweet flight, dude. Thanks, man. It's a nice reaction from the crowd. All right, guys, we're gonna just wrap this up by giving you a few tips, general tips about electric helicopters. Um, when choosing an electric helicopter, first thing you need to do is you need to decide what model you're gonna buy, obviously, and you need to choose whether you're gonna go with a stock um, electric helicopter, meaning it comes as an electric helicopter out of the factory. For example, I have my new T-Rex 700E here. This is obviously built by a line at the factory. Um, this is obviously totally different than the helicopter Bobby was flying earlier, which is just a conversion. So you need to decide whether you want to convert what you have, go with a conversion system, or buy a brand new helicopter that's built as an electric out of the factory. Um, generally, they're very different. Uh, for the most part, the ones that are built as electric out of the factory have some better features um, as electric specific but you need to decide what you want to go with if you you know um, and look at a lot of different factors for example how easy the batteries are um, to put in and out of the helicopter for example on this one the battery slide in and out it has a, a railing system where the battery comes in and out and it's very convenient very easy I can always find the same spot where to mount the battery so I don't have to be guessing um, for CG and stuff where to place the batteries um, another thing to take into account is um, gear stripping, you know, the type of main gear, Mott 1 gears usually last longer than a, a smaller teeth pattern like a Mott 7, for example. Um, counter bearing um, simply means that you have another bearing block at the end of your motor shaft to support the shaft. If you don't have that on a big, powerful 700 size electric helicopter, um, your motor shaft will give enough to um, 
take itself away from the main gear and off to strip the main gear. So you got to take that into account. If you're doing a conversion, make sure you have a counter bearing on your conversion system. The Rain MOV conversion so far is the best that I've seen. Um, let's see what else charging um, are you able to charge your batteries um, if you're going with a large electric like this you're gonna need either two chargers um, or you're gonna need two uh, one charger that's capable of charging two large 6s packs at the same time can you support the charging at home do you have a power supply that's capable of charging your helicopter can you charge at the field um, keep in mind if you don't have a generator you're gonna have your engine and your car running while you charge because otherwise you're gonna drain your car battery and uh, let's see here lastly um, I get a lot of questions about BECs. Um, personally, I do not trust BECs on a large machine. Anything that's small, like a 250, 450, even 500, I run the built-in BEC off of the speed controller. But on a large 700, even a 600 machine, I always prefer to run a separate battery pack. So on this one, I have a Thunder Power 2600 milliamp 2S pack, and I have a Spectrum 70, uh, 7100 receiver, and uh, it's just powering the receiver. So if anything ever happens to my speed controller, my batteries, my motor, I have some kind of in-flight failure there, I still have control on my servos, and I can bring the helicopter down and land it safely. So um, these are all tips that you need to keep in mind when making your selection and buying your large electric helicopter. Um, I hope you enjoy this and uh, you found these tips useful and uh, Bobby and I will see you next time. I got some shoes. <laughs> Freaking weeds. Why can't we have a nice field? This is, this is Farmer Jack's field, man. That's where it's at. I talked about everything. That's awesome. I didn't miss anything. They're sleeping. So I had two of these together. So I had 48 volts. Oh, shit. <laughs> ah! Uh, so, as many of you may or may not know, there's a lot of math involved in... Oh, crap. It's Bert. Hold on. Hello. I'm filming right now. You're on camera. You're interrupting. All right, hurry up. Bye. Oh, hurry up. Goodbye. Yeah. If you're going to meet her... I'm not doing anything. Here. This is Tweety Bird, the insectothopter. Fly it right, fly it right into let's, some booth. Let's do a demo here, here, demo, <laughs> demo. Here's the demo. Oh, <laughs> oh crap! <laughs> Tweety. Died. Design is you can take these knobs out and then slide this whole tray in and then freaking charge your batteries and everything like that. Yeah, but with these sliders, I mean, it needs like a hex. How, how's Ray going to get in there? <laughs> what the f***? Never even thought of that. Poor Ray. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm trying to get the bitch to recognize it. Recognize what? Yeah. But what are you doing? What, oh, upgrading them all. Upgrade, upgrading what? All these units. For what? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you see something you're going to regret? <laughs> oh, no. It's all right. No worries. It's outtakes. What are you doing? It's outtakes. Upgrading all the three Gs. For who? For you. For Mr. the customers? Mr. Align. Why, why do you do this? Is this like a service that Heli Wholesaler provides? A absolutely. Is that what sets Heli Wholesaler like, apart from the rest? Absolutely. First in the country to and have it. You got all these units to, up, to upgrade? Really? Yep. And what, what is better about version 2? Fixes the tail kick. Pirouette consistency as well as uh, the delay with Spectrum. Wow, you've been trained. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Big D, Big D.
What's going on, kid? How you doing, man? Man, you're the master MC. I'm just a grand facilitator. I'm, I'm motivated by guys like you. You inspire me. Dude, I'm going to tell you, this kid here, when I met you, you were flying a little raptor, looking a little erotic, looking a little crazy. Now you're like Billy Badass with the sticks, dude. You're like worldwide. Billy Badass with the sticks. Now you come up with some badass names for people, some good stuff. Do you have a name for yourself? I, I am the grand facilitator, man. I put people together. I put people together. That's badass. Grand facilitator. Grand facil the grand facilitator. Yeah, give us some nicknames that you got. Bobby's like high voltage, man. Just think about his last name and think about his flying. It's high energy, high current, high power, high voltage. The kid is bad. He's the entertainer, dude. Everything he does is entertaining to watch. Nick the entertainer, Maxwell. Kyle Cool Hand Stacy. Cool Hand Stacy. Bert is like vintage old school hardcore all rolled into one. Is that because he has old? He's old and no, has no hair? No, I can't do that because I'm older than he is, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How about uh, Curtis? Curtis is the Iceman, dude. You came up with that. That was me. He's the Iceman, you know. Jason Krause is Showtime. You know. We're, we're Alan? Some young, well, he was the future, you know, and then uh, he became the present, and he's working on being the past. <laughs> How about his brother, Danny? Danny's a player, you know. I, th I think Danny got into women a little too young. He's a player. Uh, I can't think of anyone else. Um, oh, you got, you got to talk about my newest nephew out on the West Coast. Who's your newest nephew? Kid named Kyle Dahl. Yeah. The kid's bad, dude. He flies like he's precise. He's got the whole precision thing down. He's like a machine. He's so what's Kyle his name? the robot doll. That's who he is. The kid is awesome. The hey, robot. So precise, man. He's precise. He's like on rails. Everything is calculated. It's kind of like there's a computer up there ticking, you know, and it's got to be Mac because it never breaks down. That's true. That's very, very true, man. Now, when we come in, we come to Detroit in June. What, what's the office? I hear a lot about the office. What is this office? The office is like a local hangout spot for me where people go and uh, make attempts to enjoy life. And uh, because of years of patronage and my personality, I uh, am extended several favors at the office that all my buddies are allowed to partake in. You're the most diplomatic guy I've ever met in my life. I do my best. Thanks, man. Thanks. We'll see you around. All right. You too, man. You guys have fun this weekend.